what exactly is trauma? And take that away, Amber. Brief note about the PowerPoint uh, was created by my 12 year old daughter who is super excited. <laughs> yeah. um, I let her kind of put it together. Um, so there, oh, did it go away? Oh, okay. Yeah, there are a couple slides at the end specifically dedicated to her. I think I'm looking this way because I see you down here. That's the way I can see you. I'll have to remember. Anyway, because it took you away off the screen. This way they can see. Oh. Can I move her? Can I move her? Okay. Okay, thank you, Kate. The part, I gotta get the black part. Right? I gotta get the extra on. There we go. Okay, good. All right, now we got it. <laughs> I'm learning as we go. So we may not, we may add some things here and there. We may not stick exactly to the script. Um, hearing some of the reasons that you are here and things that you want to learn about, but we'll just kind of let it unfold as that happens. And I think we'll. Um, we we're planning on making some time for questions at the end. And um, so we can come back to some of those beautiful points that you made. Um, trauma is created through our experiences and generally any unhealthy coping skill starts because it was necessary and it was helpful originally. And we're gonna kind of dive into why that is. I love this example. Um, I use this a lot with clients of a bumblebee on a flower because if you and I are both standing and looking at the flower and the bumblebee and I feel awe and wonder and I think it's so beautiful, I get serotonin, oxytocin, I have um, swelling go down in my body and I, I get a chemical response because I'm in awe and wonder because of that thought and those uh, corresponding emotions. If you happen to have an allergy, you can be looking at the exact same thing in the exact same moment and go, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die if I get yeah. stuck. So yeah. uh, you get adrenaline, you get cortisol, your heart rate speeds up, um, you, it's, inflammation increases in your body. So it's a, it's a good, concise example of the way that our thoughts affect our feelings and that affects then the chemical response in our body, which creates an entire mind, body, emotion response. So you can skip to the next one, Kira. Okay, so the amygdala is where it's at. <laughs> That's what we're going to start with. <laughs> so um, this is just a very basic breakdown of prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and amygdala. The amygdala is our sensory perception, and it is what controls our autonomic nervous system. And we're going to go into that in a minute and break it down a little bit more. But our autonomic nervous system is everything that's automated in our body. And initially, everything comes into your brain as sensory information. So you sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. Um, what we normally have happen and what we want to happen is for those various parts of your brain to talk to each other. But when a traumatic experience happens, what we can see in PET scans and MRIs is that the other areas of the brain are not lighting up. It's just amygdala. So for some reason, they're not communicating with each other. So the hippocampus is time and space orientation. Frontal cortex is reasoning, judgment, logic. So when you have an experience, let's say um, you got into a car accident and a certain song was playing on the radio when that happened. Now, every time you hear that song, immediately your heart rate starts to go up. You feel panicky in your body you start having PTSD symptoms, maybe images of the car accident. What's happening is your amygdala is activated, but not your hippocampus to say, whoa, 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 it's okay, honey, that was then, this is now, time and space, or your frontal lobe that would tell you that you're safe in that moment. Logically, you can see that you're okay and nothing is happening. So we want all these parts talking to each other Unfortunately, when we get stuck in 
a trauma loop or um, we have PTSD symptoms, they're not, they're just, in the, it's just the amygdala. Okay, you can go to the next one, Kira. So this is a basic um, example of each. So this is a basic oh, I'm um, myself echo. example of each. Uh, this is a basic. Can, can you all that are online please mute at this time? It's not on here and it's echoing. Can you hear that? Yeah, we can hear it. Lisa, can you all mute? Let me see if I can mute her. Can you go to participants? Oh, sorry. Recording. Okay, she got yeah, it. She okay. muted it. Yeah. She got it before I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, our autonomic nervous system, we, break, we can break down into sympathetic and parasympathetic. I want you to think about the sympathetic as the gas pedal and the parasympathetic as the brakes. So when your sympathetic nervous system gets triggered, your body says, okay, we need to do one of four things, which we'll go into in a minute, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. We need to get out of here. Something bad is happening to us. So your pupils expand, your um, breath generally gets faster and more shallow. Your blood flow goes to your extremities to help you run or move faster. Your gut might speed up. Um, when you're in parasympathetic and you're able to hit the brakes or your body hits the brakes, pupil size goes back down, your breathing gets more deep and slow, your heart rate decreases, your gut actually slows down. And we'll get into that a little bit more with freeze and fawn. There is um, a bell curve that I'm gonna show you in a minute uh, of what the sweet spot is <laughs> between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic because parasympathetic can also have some downsides if we are too far in that lane. Do you wanna skip to the next one, Kira? Okay, so yeah, this is just kind of um, an example of what we were just, this, this is two dimensional. So you have to remember that there are a lot of variables. Anytime uh, something happens, we may not immediately move from fight or flight to freeze and submit to, you might not, you may only stay in one. You might stay in fight for a long period of time. You might flee and then be able to calm down from that state. So this is just kind of a basic overview to give you an understanding of the possibilities and the way that they are related to each other. So when something feels to your nervous system, like it's a threat, you can think of it like a smoke detector. Um, and this is why people have phantom limb pain, for example, your nervous system knows that your arm is missing. And so the sympathetic nervous system that's that information is just in your amygdala is repeatedly telling you there's something wrong with your arm. There's something wrong with your arm. There's something wrong with your arm. And logically, you know, frontal lobe, I get it. It's not there. <laughs> you can settle down. But since they're not communicating with each other, people have phantom limb pain. We have techniques and tools to help with that now that are actually very effective and um, are used a lot for veterans and, and medical issues, as well as emotional trauma. Um, and so, I mean, this one is sort of the same as the last as far as information, but I just wanna point out that it's not always linear in that way. If something is coming and you feel a perceived threat and you immediately pull out your weapons, you, you know, maybe make a sarcastic comment or you get angry, you start yelling, you're in fight mode. If all you want to do is get away and you have to get out and that's all you, you're, all you can think about, you're in flight. Um, one of the things that happens that's really important to explain to people is that when they're in, when they're having their trauma experience, and this can be days, hours, years later, when you're triggered, you go into tunnel vision. And so it's very difficult to see 
the rest of the perspective because it's like shining a spotlight on that one thing that happened. And just like when you shine a spotlight, you only see what's right here. And we wanna help them back that light up so that they can see that safety and other things exist as well. Um, you skip to the next one, Kira. And I can talk a little bit more about, okay, so this is the bell curve, which uh, most people don't know that the freeze response is actually the top. Most people, I think the general population, for some reason, pop culture maybe seems to think that fight or flight is, is where it's at. And that's kind of the only thing that happens when you have a panic attack or you um, are experiencing trauma. But, and that would be your sympathetic nervous system on the way up. You can see panic, fear, anxiety, rage, anger, irritation. But when you get to the top of the bell curve, your parasympathetic nervous system is actually trying to help you to come back down. But because it's so intense, you can go into freeze uh, and fawn. And what happens is numbness, oftentimes dissociation. You can kind of see people glaze over. Um, or you might have experienced that yourself where you're just, you feel a little like checked out, um, maybe not fully in your body. That's generally a freeze response. So I have clients that often feel very discouraged and down on themselves because they don't feel like doing anything. They don't feel like they want to jump in and let me deal with this trauma. And I'm going to come every week to therapy and I'm going to run and I'm going to, you know, whatever, whatever things they think will help. That would actually be the fight or flight response. And they have to be able to come back down a little bit in order to even get to the point where they feel like they can take action. Does that make sense? everybody yeah, very awesome mm -hmm. questions so far let me let me uh, put this on a different view so i can see if anybody online has questions so far um ask them to raise their hand yeah now that i know you can raise your hand <laughs> <laughs> i have a question are you going to cover the dorsal vagal and the ventral vagal next time right kira you split it up oh. Okay. It'll be here next next okay. Wednesday. We'll talk about that. Yeah, Roberta. Isn't this like the gambler? Know when to hold and know when to fold and know when to walk away. <laughs> know when to run. All Maybe it's something like that. <laughs> yeah. Except if the gambler had been hijacked and didn't get to decide that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. One of my first exposures to um, to real life friend that was in serious PTSD was when he had been kidnapped when he was in Africa and he was getting ready to leave town and he got kidnapped and taken to his ATM and ATM and forced to pull out his money and you know all kinds of different things they let him go dropping him off to say you may go directly on your air your airplane anything else and we will find you and you know you won't we won't leave the country it was kind of like it was very mm -hmm. interesting but it, he started to explain to me his whole process with ptsd so yeah then definitely to be hijacked as part of you know. <laughs> so let's circle back around for a second um what happens when your when your sympathetic nervous system gets triggered is that everything that's automated in your body starts firing. Your breath is really the only thing that you have control of that is part of your autonomic nervous system, which remember is the amygdala. So you might know logically that when, when it's time to hold them and when it, it's time to fold them, <laughs> when it's time to walk away, but you may not be able to make yourself. You may not feel in congruence with what you know logically. And that's the disconnect that we saw in the earlier slide of the amygdala versus the frontal lobe and the hippocampus. When those aren't talking to each other, that's part of why it feels so out of control and powerless to be having PTSD symptoms because you can't, you can't do anything um, to, to make your body not respond that way in that moment. We're going to talk about strategies to help yourself um, come back down and get into parasympathetic. 
But one of the things that's really important in being able to have compassion and validate yourself is to understand as you start feeling panicky, as you start getting irritated or wanting to flee the room because you're then you're on your way up right when you go into that if you can recognize okay i i think i'm I'm starting to have some ptsd symptoms then you're at a point of power in your consciousness that you can make some decisions about how you want to handle it in that moment as you're experiencing it you're still going to feel it in your body because you don't get to just turn it off you wouldn't survive if you did (laughs) because it's how your body keeps you alive. We just need to get those parts talking to each other so that you can help yourself calm down. Well, and I think it seems to me that the the more we work with our own traumas and noticed our own triggers, identified our defenses, and we often learn that not only in our own life, but in our relationships with others, we'll mirror it back to us, right? Mm-hmm. And in that, mm-hmm. then we begin to realize we can see as it's coming on. The other part mm-hmm. is getting, I want to say, is getting comfortable enough with yourself that you're noticing your own discomfort. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times we go on automatic pilot through life and we're not really paying attention to I've got this 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 energy starting to build up inside of me and it's creating an anxiety it's creating something something may have triggered it but the minute I start having that if I can pay attention and notice then I have more opportunity. Now, the challenge is, as Amber said, when we have a PTSD trigger, we may be already so far into that that there's no communication happening. But the more we can start to pay attention to what triggers our our anxiety, our stress, our reactiveness to things, we can begin to start going, oh, wait, what different choice? Can I make a choice? We start to regain our power in our ability to respond. So I think yeah. that's important in that process too. And now I'm, I'm, I'm curious, cause I have to say to Amber too, you know, I've said to you all that when I met with Amber to talk through our presentation and go through this uh, the other day, she taught me something I had never heard before. So now how many of you know about fight or flight? Okay, how many know fight, flight or freeze? Most of y'all know fight, flight or freeze. How many of you know fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Like a couple of you have your hand up. I've never heard. heard Yeah, Mark? I I had a question. Um, So in the current literature, like Van Kolk and all that, they talk about fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. So are you saying that the fawn is similar to collapse? Yeah, there are a variety of terms. that kind of get thrown around. And as long as we're talking about the same set of neurochemical responses, it's yeah, basically that would be the same thing. Cause sometimes people don't use the word freeze either. They use um, fight, flight, and I'm drawing a blank what the other one is. But for a long time, I heard that a lot. I think sometimes the literature just changes, but yeah, we'll get into in a second what fawning is, but collapse is part of that. Essentially, you've sort of burnt out your, your nervous mm-hmm. system. So yes, I would- They had say- referred to that in, you know, I read his uh, book and they were, they were comparing sexual assault victims who fought the perpetrator and who just gave up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah. Uh, the ones that just collapsed had far more PTSD than the ones who fought. Correct. Yes. Um, so. Anyways, that, now that clarifies for me. Yeah, yeah. And I want to come back to that in just a second. I want to speak to what Kira said first, and then, and then we'll come back to that in the next slide, I think, is about on. So it's important to remember that the more that you can be in your body and notice the sensations in your body, the faster you're going to be able to identify when you're triggered and what to do about it. And that's part of the reason to show the slide about the gut and the importance of the gut, because not only do we talk about gut as our instinct, but we talk about that in part because we feel it in our gut. If something feels off, there's generally 
a physiological reason because you're creating stress hormones in your body. You're on your way up. And so your stomach hurts or it doesn't, something isn't sitting right. Like all of those analogies, right? So when we have a PTSD response, um, we tend to check out of our, our bodies. It may not be complete dissociation, but it's very hard oftentimes for people to be fully present when they feel all that discomfort. Um, it's interesting because there are a lot of correlations between the type of trauma and where people feel it in their body. So I always encourage people to pay attention to that. Um, for instance, if somebody was in a severely abusive relationship and they never had a voice, they might tend to feel like their throat's closing up or they might actually get illnesses in their throat fairly often. Um, when people have chronic anxiety, a lot of times their neck and shoulders, they're carrying a lot of weight. Your body speaks to you in such beautiful ways, but they're very subtle. So the more that we tune into our body, the more we can work to identify when you're feeling triggered, maybe what the trigger is, and then what you want to do about it. Cause it also can help you kind of guide you in what direction you want to go. So Kira, if you want to click to the next slide and then I can come back to Mark's question. And let me say one other thing in there because I'm going to bring in that spiritual perspective um, that, you know, one of the things we talk about the times that we're in, that we are embodying our Christ consciousness, that many of us in the spiritual world went out to, you know, our spiritual dimensions to say, okay, let me experience what's out here. How fun is that to go play in the outer realms? And yet what we're being called is to bring in the true Christ power into an embodied experience. And that means that we've learned to be in our bodies. And so part of healing our trauma is actually preparing us to actually engage our full Christ consciousness through the various dimensions. And to know that we do that through an embodied presence, not by stepping outside of ourselves, but feeling the power of that within us. And so healing our traumas creates the spaciousness, the openness, the attentiveness to our internal senses and our awareness in such a way that we, we empower that which is the higher self, the Christ consciousness, whatever name you want to give to that higher power, to, to that divine essence that we are, that we're actually creating the space for that. And healing our traumas actually gets us set up to take on more of that true uh, empowered spiritual consciousness. So it has many reasons that we want to work on these, on these realms. So thank you for letting me insert that, Amber. Yeah, and we're going to get into a little bit more of that next time when we get into um, energy body and um, more, more of the what we do going forward. Um, so we'll, we'll talk even more about that then. Thank you, Kira, for adding that. So um, there is a correlation. I think this speaks to what your experience was, Mark. There's a correlation between early childhood trauma, the earlier in life you experience it, and defaulting to freeze and submit. Because by the time we get to, or freeze and fawn, that's another, yeah, people, people say freeze and submit, freeze and fawn. Uh, by the time you get to that point, at the top of the bell curve, you can't fight. So when you're little or powerless in a situation and that those memories are stored at the time. So I, I didn't say earlier, I should have mentioned that memory is stored based on those sensory experiences. And it's not stored in a linear fashion because remember that's the hippocampus. So when you store a memory of a traumatic experience, and because it feels as though it's happening now and not then, you tend to default to whatever mechanism you were able to use at the time. So when kids or young adults experience trauma, they most often go into freeze and submit, which would explain why some victims were able to fight and some weren't. Um, we also didn't include in the in the PowerPoint, but it's worth mentioning, I think that there is something called complex PTSD. And that's when it's not just one incident, it's multiple layered over time. And so it can have 
additional symptoms and take a little bit longer to sort of peel back the layers. Um, and again, healing can be as rapid as we allow ourselves to make it. There are a, a multitude of amazing things available to help you with that. But the reason to point it out is that if you feel like you've experienced trauma throughout your life, you may have complex PTSD at this point and want to learn more, you know, even just Googling, looking online at what that means specifically so that you understand any additional symptoms that might come up for you. Um, when people have a trauma response, we think of these four things because they're the classic, they're the classic symptoms that of what we go through. But there are a lot of other pieces uh, that aren't generally talked about or recognized outside of the mental health field, like not slowing down ever, for instance. Um, if something happens and you just continuously keep yourself busy and you launch yourself into the next project, the next project, taking care of my kids, you don't ever take the time to be quiet and be still. That's also a trauma symptom. As an example of one that, you know, um, some people may or may not have heard of. So the freeze response um, is where your, your body slows down, your gut slows down. I like to explain it like a bunny hiding in a bush. You know, you're sort of doing this. You wanna get smaller. Your blood flow goes away from your extremities to go to your internal organs to give you all the power it can to just keep you alive. But your parasympathetic at that point is overactive in response to the sympathetic. So on your way up, fight or flight, you can't, you feel for some reason that you can't fight or you literally cannot fight. Maybe you're, you know, being assaulted or something and you can't, you can't fight back. You're going to get to a freeze state in general. Fawning is less about the hormonal and chemical response and more in terms of the way that people, again, going back to if you had childhood trauma or early life trauma, the way that you teach yourself to get through it and habits that become, they're, they, they become habitual simply because your brain automates them. And you may not even realize that you're doing it because you that's just your normal. So things like codependent behavior, um, being hyper aware of reading the energy in the room, who's upset, who do I need to go make a joke to? Oh, that person looks sad, maybe they need a hug. And you're so distanced from yourself because the focus is on other. If I put the focus on other, I won't get hurt or bad things won't happen to me. And generally speaking, when, when kids and adolescents experience trauma, they learn at a very early age to, to read the room, to walk on eggshells, to do the things, whatever they need to do to adjust themselves so that the bad things don't happen to them. Um, and, they, and when you store it at a younger age, you don't have the cognitive ability or understanding to know what that is until you're much older. So fawning often looks like exhaustion or the crash that happens after you go into the freeze state. So you, you work your way up, you get to the top of that. And then as you're coming back down, you might find that you just absolutely crash from all the adrenaline, maybe from the emotional exhaustion of trying to tend to everyone's needs and make sure everyone around you is happy and okay, because that feels safe to you. So I want to stop and ask if there's questions because I feel like that was a lot at once. <laughs> I wanted to say, you know, I think this was the one that I had not heard of. And I thought, and in fact, when I said it to Amber, I said, oh my gosh, I've never, I've never heard that, but I, re, I, I, I can, I can relate to it. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, it's a family, it's a family <laughs> consistent process for our family. And I said, I get it. We learned to fawn, you know, mm -hmm. like it, 
when you say something and then you're scared you were too direct, then you're going to go back and make everybody feel okay. And da -da -da -da, you're going to fawn over everybody in that way. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, yes, that's so much our family. You know? And so we had to laugh about that. But, but the truth is, is that I was, I was, it was empowering to hear that. Mm -hmm. because then we can see our own activity in the process to say, where do I have my own defense mechanisms, re, you know, responding, even if they're not totally PTSD, they still may be defense mechanisms that respond to stress or different situations that way. So you might recognize there's many ways that you can apply this information into understanding the way you're operating and then be able to make changes. So that was one thing I wanted to add about that that I thought was interesting. And then what other questions do people have at this point? Uh, it's a lot of information, but yeah, Gene. So um, would that kind of apply to someone who's in a really crappy marriage for a long period of time and you spent, you know, 15, 20 years walking on eggshells to, to not get that person upset? Yes. Yeah. Um, so codependency falls kind of under that category of putting the other person first to avoid the backlash. Um, so yes, and I would call those kind of micro traumas, you know, that you, if you're in a 20 year marriage and it's like that the entire time, there are most likely things that have happened over that 20 year period that were traumatic to you. And trauma by definition is anything that your nervous system can't handle in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I often hear people say, well, it wasn't that bad. It's not like I was raped or something. It's not like I, you know, and they give these ex like very severe examples. And so it's important to explain that. So they understand that their trauma is just as valid as the next person's. It, it doesn't have to be that bad. There is no such thing in your brain. It's just a smoke alarm. And when it's, or feels or hears or whatever, anything similar, the alarm goes off. So absolutely the fawn response is something that you could see in between PTSD symptoms, for instance, in between the triggers. If you have learned over time in order to survive, um, to do these things, then that makes sense to you. Go, again, going back to like all of our unhealthy coping skills, coping mechanisms started for a reason. So yes, it could be what, like Kira said, a, a weapon of its own. Um, but I would, con but I consider fawning a weapon that's sort of directed at yourself because mm -hmm. the counter to that, the balance to that is boundary setting and using your own voice or leaving that marriage or that person um, getting out of the situation, whatever it is that that is helping empower you. Beautiful. Hey, buddy, I don't know the hand is still up. Is that, do you have a new question or was that just from before? I don't know if he can hear me. Mm -hmm. Talk to the hand. <laughs> Talk to the hand. <laughs> I think he hears you. No. Okay, no problem. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah, Cindy. I've got one for you, Kira. And then Eugenia. Uh, the disconnected from own body and needs. When you're in trauma and you disconnect, are you losing part of your soul? No. You cannot lose part of your soul is what I would answer that is you don't lose part of your soul. You may lose conscious awareness of all the parts of yourself. Um, Amber, do you have anything additional you'd like to add to that? Um, just that we all dissociate. It's, it's a normal part of our human experience. It is that feeling when you drive from point A to point B, but you don't really remember getting there because is a form of association i heard someone mention that at the beginning um it's a what way what did you say oh, hypnosis. oh okay yeah uh-huh um because essentially what you're doing in that process is mm -hmm. intentionally shutting down the parts of your brain that 
would ration like your frontal lobe, the rational, logical. So you can't think your way out of it. <laughs> And it's, and it's important to note that you can't think your way, this is why you can't think your way out of feelings. Um, and your feelings are never wrong because they're not logical. Different parts of the brain, you can stop telling yourself, I shouldn't feel that. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't. We call that shitting all over yourself in therapy. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Eugenia had a question and then Roger. Yeah. Eugenia, you want to unmute so we can hear you? She doesn't hear you. I think she's trying to unmute. Okay, uh, I'm here. I just want to ask Amber a question and I think I'm going ahead of yourself, but I'd like to know if people can actually heal or do they have to leave learning to manage the trauma? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. We could do a whole other class on how that happens neurologically, but yes, people can heal. And it's one of the things I'm most passionate about. It's so phenomenal to watch and it doesn't have to take years. We know so much now about the brain and the way that neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, and so that repetition of thought not just action, but our thoughts, our consciousness and our awareness, when we shift that, we then shift our feelings. We then shift the chemical responses in our body. So that first slide um, that talked about the B is a, is a perfect example if you do that in the opposite direction. So maybe as you're working through your trauma, we're helping you understand what the connection is between this sensory thing that occurred and your past trauma. And then we can look at, talk about, and integrate new ways of thinking about it, grow up those memories, because a lot of times um, the child who experienced that or the young adult, even if it's your 20 year old self, you know, you know how you think, you know, a lot when you're 20 and then when you're 40, <laughs> you laugh because you knew nothing, but your 20 year old self stored the memory. So your 40 year old self may be the one that needs to say, Hey, 20 year old me, look at all the things that we've done. Look at what we've accomplished and what we've kept ourselves safe from and look at how much we can trust us. So it's okay if anything is happening out here because we're okay, because we've gotten there. And the more that we change our association, our perception and our thoughts about that, the more you shift those neurochemical responses in your body and you make new neural networks because again, the neurons that fire together, wire together, it's an electrical impulse that goes from point A to point B. That's why it may, it's hard to like break a habit because you have to stop doing the thing. So there's no more electrical impulse and slowly that connection will die off and you start doing something new and feed that connection with more and more electrical impulse. And that gets fatter and fatter. If you picture it kind of like little tree branches in your brain. So yes, absolutely. You can, and mm -hmm. it may take longer for people who have more layers of trauma, but learning to, the question about learning to deal with them or cope with them, I can't remember exactly how you worded that, but that's manage the trauma. what, Kira? You said manage the trauma. Manage, yes. Okay. So in that process, you're already on the path of healing your trauma because the more that you understand and can check in with yourself, notice what you're feeling, notice the thoughts that come up in that management process, you're doing that work towards that goal of being completely healed. So what we want to achieve, um, what I do through EMDR, um, which stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, and we can talk, talk about that briefly later, but what we're wanting to achieve is that it's not that the memory itself changes or that we are pretending in any way that the incident didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's that we're disconnecting the intensity of emotion so that mm -hmm. instead of being activated in your physical body, when you think of that thing, 
um, or are reminded of it via your sensory perception. It's just a story. It's just like telling a narrative of part of your life. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's very nice. Yeah. yeah I I think you, go ahead, Eugenia. No, I say I completely understand, and but that was something that was never cleared in my mind. Mm. But it makes sense, and also the well, I'm also a counselor, and what I do say to my clients is that they need to create their own mantras, mm. the positive mantra they can repeat to themselves all the, themselves all the time to shadow the negative thoughts that they have about themselves. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Amber. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. You. Thanks for asking. Yeah, and I was going to say, additionally, this gets into where unity comes in with teaching denials and affirmations. Mm -hmm. We deny something to have power over me, and I begin to affirm something that I can now take on and, and begin, like she's saying, a mantra I can put in place of that fear thought or that, that situation. So we'll talk more about that next week, too. Roger had his hand up earlier, too. Roger, do you want to uh, uh, share your question? Yes. Yes, uh, hi, Amber. Um, hi. All the things you have described appear to fall into the category of unhealthy coping mechanisms. And I'm a little overwhelmed. I mean, like, okay, what's a healthy coping <laughs> mechanism? Where is it? What, what does one do? Right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's such a good question. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, yes, I'm <laughs> sorry that it's overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, so a healthy thing to do, for instance, when you feel triggered is to slow down and check in with yourself. Where do I feel it in my body? What kind of thoughts are coming up right now? Am I catastrophizing in my mind? Am I ruminating on the thing that happened before? Because that's when you can insert healthy coping mechanism, kind of like Eugenia was saying, you know, maybe you start saying a mantra to yourself or you start taking deep breaths and you um, kind of work on recentering. I don't know if that answers the question or you just mean like daily activities of things that are healthy. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, in a, in a way it does, yeah. Uh, but I understand that some of these processes are actually unconscious and we may not actually be aware that they are they are happening uh, uh so help help me with that one if you would please yeah okay. good clarification yeah sometimes they're unconscious most of the time you can feel in your physical body when your sympathetic nervous system starts to activate because your breath gets more shallow you might um, feel anxious. Sometimes people's palms get sweaty, their stomach hurts, whatever that physical sensation is, which is why it's so important to kind of check in with your body. Um, the more that you learn about how this works, the more you're automatically going to be conscious of the way that you respond because it's different for everybody. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do in therapy is ask people what they're experiencing in their body when they're having these negative um, correlations to a past trauma so that they can be more conscious. Um, but in general, I would say you can usually tell in some way in your body. It might even be that your muscles get tight or your shoulders go up. Um, sometimes people ball up their fists or they shrink down. They, you feel, I always talk to people about feeling expansive versus contracting. When you feel like getting smaller, that's an indication. Something is, doesn't feel right. Something is happening. And, and then when you realize that you can insert a healthy coping skill or a, some, whatever it is that you decide you want to do. Um, we're going to teach you some, but insert here. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's going to be a part of what we we do also in this process is start to look at what are the things that we can do to heal our own traumas and to. But first, we have to understand that we all have trauma responses, and a lot of times we think of that as like Amber said in these most 
most difficult traumatic things that we, many of us have had those too. But then there's other things that have continued to trigger along the way. And in that moment of being triggered, it's like being in that trauma response all over again. And then, okay, now all of a sudden, all this is active within me. What do I do about it? Right? That's the, the next part of this. Amber, was there anything additional you wanted to share before we went on to some of the what to do options? Or, we can talk about tonight. Yeah. Oh, I've always got things to share. <laughs> I'm trying to decide which direction to go or how much. Probably not. Let's I, wait. For ants. Yeah, there's always <laughs> things to share. <laughs> yeah, let's let's yeah, let's just keep going so that we have time for questions at the end. I think that would be good. Okay, yeah. So I think one of the things we wanted to talk about next are what is it you do with your trauma now? Um, what are the options that are available to you? I'm gonna uh, bring this back down smaller again. I gotta figure this all out. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Oh, so we can say, what can we do? That was the next question. The next slide that we have is what can we do? Um, I'm going to go to the speakers. Uh, right here at the top, you can make it small. Drag it to the top corner, top right corner, and right there. There you go. Drag it. I'll drag it down diagonally. I'm trying. I'm not very good at this. I'm just going to move it for a minute. <laughs> move it somewhere else. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to go into this. Um, Amber, you want to touch on this next slide? Do you, do you, do you, for you, embrace you? So Delphi is so, my daughter's name is Delphi. She's so proud of this. Um, and it, it just made me think of her because she, she wanted to make it orange because orange is happy and we're talking about being positive and so so positive self-talk is um one of the most impactful ways that you can help shift what you're feeling emotionally and in your body and this is where love and compassion really come into play. So instead of beating yourself up for having a trauma response, maybe maybe it's as simple as um, your partner did something that you don't like and you got snippy with them because it's related to something that's happened in the past, maybe a previous argument. So you snap at them. You can either beat yourself up and tell yourself that you're awful and you're never going to be a good person or whatever horrible things. Or you can say, okay, that was a moment. Uh, I didn't love that. Let's maybe not do that again. You did so good self at trying to bring yourself back down. We're just having a rough day today. What can, what can I do? What can I, what do you need right now? Do we, do we need a hug? Do we need to go cry in the closet to just move that emotion through our body um, and you check in with yourself and you talk to yourself as though you're talking to your loved ones because we have this bizarre double standard in our society where we say the meanest things to ourselves that we would never say to our spouse, to our children, to our best friend. And if we did, our best friend would probably not be around us anymore. So, you know, we don't want to um, devalue ourselves in our own head. And that is one of the things that can be the most unconscious is that people learn children, especially, um, because of the developmental phase that you go through where you are not, you don't realize right away that you're separate from your parents. You, you assume that if they are, then you are. And so what you hear around you, if your parents maybe are very negative, maybe they were doing the best that they could, but they were struggling, then you might internalize self-talk around struggle, around how hard everything is and life isn't fair. And um, so learning about what your thought patterns are, what your belief systems, your core beliefs about life can be very powerful in helping you change to more positive self-talk and positive feedback. Now, when I was learning this earlier in life, I think it was during college, I had to write a paper, undergrad, I had to write a paper on my parents, how my parents communicated, like 
in a, in a positive, they meant it in a positive way, but I went to the professor and I said, I can't write that paper because they don't, <laughs> they're awful. I can write you a phenomenal paper on how they don't communicate, which he said, okay, great. And I got an A. <laughs> and in that process, I realized that I come from a family that the glass is always half empty. So I, I really had no um, schema, no previous idea of what that looked like or sounded like. So I used things like um, affirmation cards. You can buy card decks like Louise Hay. I don't know if, if you guys are familiar, if you talk about that much, but um, any kind of positive affirmations, which I think is the next slide, can help you to create new habits. And this also goes back to the previous statement from um, Eugenia, I think, about mantras can be a very effective way of giving yourself something to hold on to. Just pick one. If you just pick one for the day and, and then you focus on that, you can write it on your mirror. You can put it up sticky notes around your house. Um, you yeah. can put it on the dash of your car. Anything that you can do to help yourself create a new habit of being more loving and more compassionate to yourself. So these are just some examples of um, reparenting your inner child affirmations. There are thousands of free affirmations online. You can Google, you can go on Pinterest, you can look on YouTube. You can make your own. And in fact, that's often one of the most powerful things to do is actually to write your own, record it on your phone. And so it's in your own voice and then play those back because your subconscious will take that in even more when it's in your own voice. Um, but these are an example of ways that you can talk to yourself like you would talk to a child because it's that little, little girl, little boy part of you that integrated that self-talk from what they were hearing around them. And then that becomes automated. So we're wanting, um, and we're not going to go a whole lot into, into parts work or inner child work, but you know, the basic premise is that you're helping love that child in whatever ways you maybe didn't get to experience. And so then you're doing it now as an adult, kind of like we were talking about before with the 20 year old self and the 40 year old self, same idea, but just using intention behind your thoughts. I want to say something about this too, because what I have found uh, so many times when we go into that place of, of wounding, uh, the trauma, whatever it was we experienced at that moment, then we're, we're seeing from a child's perspective. But then we try to talk ourselves into, as an adult, figuring it all out, rather than recognizing we need to address the child at the level that they're responding. They're feeling these feelings at this moment. And that's why like these affirmations about parenting are reparenting our our inner child are so important because at that point our little child yes our adult mind wants to give you a logical answer oh but your parents aren't so bad da, 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 da. oh that you know we love them we don't want them you know to not know we love but if this, the child is going eh, you know, I, I want to kick them you know they weren't there for me or whatever it might be we're angry we're hurt we're we're experiencing things so we have to address at the level of the child of what it is that they're experiencing. And then we do learn to bypass, and go, not bypass, but to go through those experiences and release them in such a way that the child can literally grow up in a way through that process. Now, like she said, we, inner child work is a whole nother mm -hmm. workshop and maybe we need to do one on that. I've done one before, I think, and um, I'd be happy to do that again because it's a very powerful thing. I, you know, we each have ways we learn to work with the inner child and do key processes with the inner child so that's a piece but part of it is as simple as reprogramming that immediate thought we have when a circumstance arises you know notice what immediately your thought process is and what is it you need to reset when you go to um to bring in you know like a new message what would be the message and it's got to be something not that you have to believe it 100 percent 
But at some level, you can't be so far fetched that you can't possibly believe it, mm -hmm. right? If you're doing something that, you know, uh, that is you're not believing at all, it's going to be hard mm -hmm. to go through that and get that to sink into your consciousness, mm -hmm. um, to your subconscious, because it's going to reject it, right? Mm -hmm. So you find ways. One of the things I teach people is if you don't really feel willing, to take that message on, just be willing to be willing. Am I willing, willing, right? In this moment, I'm willing to be willing to, you know, open my heart. I'm willing to be willing to be gentle with myself, whatever it might be, to feel safe. I'm willing to be willing to feel safe in my body. Um, so you find ways that you're communicating that you can actually hear as well. So that was a, a piece that I feel like is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and to piggyback off of that, um, part of what you were saying is when we go into that place of trying to explain and think through everything, it's, it's important to remember that you can't think through your feelings. They are different parts of the brain. So you can ruminate about it and think about it and think about it and think about it for weeks, years. If it, if you're not addressing the feeling, it's <laughs> never going to change or shift. So, and another thing that feels important to say that I didn't put a slide in about is the crescendo, the wave of emotion as it, as it occurs. Um, I like to compare it to putting a cement wall up in the ocean. It doesn't stop the waves from happening. It just creates something for them to come out sideways. They don't, it's not, it's not a smooth transition. It just hits the wall and comes out in all kinds of wonky ways, which is what happens to us when we try to repress or, or not feel an emotion. So it's normal to have negative thoughts when that wave is hitting you. And if you start to pay attention, you can kind of feel when your frontal lobe comes back online because you might be having all these negative thoughts and feelings. Maybe you cry or you punch a pillow or whatever. And then as you start to calm back down, that's when you can start to insert the positive thoughts because now you're a little more rational, you're a little more logical, and those parts are talking to each other. But it's really important to validate for yourself and empathize with yourself. Like I'm, this is the wave. I'm in the wave of emotion. It will pass. I know it will pass. I just need to write it out. And that can look different for different people. Um, for me, I can tell when I need to cry because I start getting really irritable. And that has become over the years an indication if I'm getting snappy, I think I know now I need to go cry <laughs> and I need to let myself feel it. So that wave can come and go because it's going to go so much faster if I don't try to stop it, if I don't fight against it and I let go of that resistance. One of the things that I have taught people to do, which will kind of lead into this, this belly breathing or these other breathing exercises, because as we said earlier, Amber said earlier, Breath is an important part of what we do have control of. And so when that anxiety buildup, that, that intensity, that and all of that that's happening, you know, I've often taught people you've got to find a way to get that out of the body so that then you can you can calm down, go back into that parasympathetic system. So one of the things that, you know, and I have clients do this in my office, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see me because. I'm going to have to bend down, but I literally have somebody do like a squat and go, ah, 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 you know, get it out of your body because we really have to have a release mm -hmm. of energy because mm -hmm. part of what happens is we have an energy build up mm -hmm. and we may need to release that energy. Now, somebody else may be able to go, <sighs> I'm fine. I, I gotta so. get real guttural and yeah. primordial about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get this energy out because it's stuck in me at this mm -hmm. moment. I can feel it, the build up. It may be like she said, you go cry or you go, you find ways, but somehow there needs to be a way to release that energy so I can move out of that frozen space or out, you know, out of that other experience. So when we start talking about, sometimes it's a simple technique, 
that doesn't have to be difficult to help shift the moment and the experience so that then something else can come in. Your logic can come back online. You can come back down from that freeze into the fight flight, at least be able to have some control again. Um, so it's some sense of, of that things can change. So that's one of the things that I, you know, people think I'm crazy. Or I used to, when I was working downtown in Houston and, you know, in, in the gallery area, I would go out into my car and I would drive to where there was like a quiet little neighborhood or even an industrial district where nobody was. And I would scream. <laughs> I would scream to get this stuff out, to get this energy out. Because I need, I knew I needed a physical response. To my to my situation some people can because we get stuck in our heads and we're not really getting to where we're changing it because we're not being physical about it and mm -hmm. to get myself back into my body i had to get physical yeah early one thing i do is i have people take a pillow and if they have a guest room it's better but uh, <laughs> go in there and beat down on the mattress use your whole body if you must pass, do uh, warn your family, but whatever it takes to get that anger out of your body and it needs to be physical. And at the end, do it till you're just exhausted. And at the end, oh, you've got all these wonderful endorphins, like you just ran a mile and uh, <laughs> it works really well. That's, a, works great, really that's well. a great one. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk for a minute about the belly breathing because we're right at 8.15 already and a few more minutes left. And we want to give you another couple of examples that we have, um, you know, brought, brought to, to say, here's some things that you can do that are simple to help uh, take this a different direction. Amber, you want to talk about that? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I was waiting for the slide. Um, I, this one is just, this particular slide is about the benefits of belly breathing. And then the next one has some examples. Um, yeah, movement is extremely important, not just in terms of moving energy, but absolutely for that. But also there is a chemical response again, like we were talking about earlier, when your joints hit together, whether you're walking, punching a pillow, <laughs> um, full body shaking can be uh, phenomenal for, yep, just take, you can set one minute on your phone and you just shake your entire body. Um, whenever those, those joints come together, they create oxytocin and serotonin and help you get back into parasympathetic. There's also a very good reason physiologically that guttural noises like screaming and grunting help us do that as well, but we're going to get to that next time. Um, belly breathing. Remember at the beginning, I said that breath is the only part of the autonomic nervous system that we have any control over. And it also creates movement in our body where we're expanding and then contracting. So there are, there's a multitude of reasons why that's helpful. Um, also showing our body that if we can slow down and take deep breaths rather than the rapid shallow breaths, remember from the sympathetic, if we're slowing down intentionally and taking deep belly breaths, we're telling our brain that our body says, oh, okay, the, the lion is gone. We can stop. We're not being chased anymore. We, we must not be because we're clearly not running, you know? And so at a very, um, physiological level. It has a lot of benefits. And one of the things I love is you can do it anywhere. Nobody has to know that you're doing that. You can be triggered in the line at the grocery store and um, start being intentional about your breath and timing it in a certain way. And you, you are you laughing at me, Kira? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> I used to teach uh, child care professionals and um, owners of child care centers about work, you know, both with children and with parents. And, you know, we used to talk about, you know, they go into anxiety as the parents coming at them, you know, with all these. And I'd say, okay, you start going. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Just or you calm yourself down, you know, one of the other. <laughs> um, do you want to click to the next slide? And then <laughs> yeah. There is there are a plethora of ways to do 
deep breathing or belly breathing. Um, this is just one slide with a few suggestions. I mean, you can go, I, I've done breath work practices formally for a little over a year. It's been transformational for me um, in terms of just like setting a new normal for my nervous system. So there's a whole rabbit hole to go down potentially if you're interested or it seems like it would be beneficial um, around what that is and what that looks like. But these are just some basic techniques that you can use quickly, easily. They're easy to remember. Why don't we do a couple of breathing no. exercises? Hello, you have a question? Hello, buddy? Did you have a question? No, I don't. Oh, okay. We hear you. We hear you saying hello. <laughs> okay, so if we were to do something like, for example, I, if everybody wants to do one of these, let's just do the box breath. Mm -hmm. And that be the one that's not easy. We start to inhale big for five counts. So let's do that. One, two, three, four, five. Now hold for five counts. One, two, three, four, five, and then exhale. One, slowly, two, three, four, five. And you do this again for four or five rounds. But can you feel already just one breath, how it changed you, right? It made it, it transitioned something within you, just doing one. So if you do it four or five times, then suddenly, you come to another kind of a, a, a plane, a median that you're on at that point. So these are examples that you can try and there's so many more, but we know that breath, and this is why yoga and meditation, and we're gonna talk more about some of those other things next week, but are so powerful for us as well. But to start to give you a few different ideas to start with. Um, you're excited to looking to that? Yes, yeah, please, go ahead. I want to I want to say because I don't think it's on the slide. It's it's really important to breathe from the bottom up. We tend to breathe incorrectly in Western society, and we breathe from our diaphragm. And what you want is to to fill up here first, and up. If that makes sense, you want to fill the bottom of your abdomen, and and then your lungs next. So it feels different, but as you start to practice that, and you can even put your hands on your lower abdomen, just like feel the rise and fall, if that helps you, um, you start to train yourself to breathe more deeply in general so that you're not walking around all day, every day with shallow breath. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. Yeah, and you can do this during the day, during different times, like she's saying, in different moments, to just give yourself that, that comfort zone of learning to breathe from the, the deep part of your belly and finding that then you can change your experience in, a, in any moment because you've gotten comfortable with it. Now it can become an easy thing for you to access. We spent a lot of time in, I, I guess, my early on yoga days learning to breathe that way. And I think it really changed my ability to calm my body down, right? And my mind, so both, all right? And that's um, the one I, I don't want people to be afraid of because it seems like a 21 breath seems like a lot. In the yogic practices, they often call that breath of fire. It's more activating when you wanna move energy. You're going, a bunch of little inhales, little inhales. It doesn't have to be 21 in a row. It could be 10, it could be 15. And then you slowly breathe out and then a bunch of little inhales. And that has a different purpose than box breathing, for instance. So if you're wanting to scream, <laughs> but you can't because you're not in an empty parking lot inside your car, <laughs> you can start doing the breath of fire practice and help deescalate. And people may not even notice that you're doing that. So it's one of the most like handy, um, broad things that you can integrate into your life. 
And we have used similar practices over longer extended time periods to open us up spiritually at times. Some of you that did some of the oneness work with us, where we did the Ananda Mandala, which is a, a particular breath of fire practice that comes out of India. And it would actually, if doing it over a longer time period, begin to open up to experience you know, some of the higher dimensional realms as well. So there are, there are various ways that you can use these practices. But right now we're talking about trauma. So we're gonna use them for our trauma basis, but they also then, our breath work is a very, very powerful influence on being able to open yourself at every level. You know, your whole body temple and your heart and your sense of what's what's possible. So very powerful. I want to go ahead. It's, it's 825. So I want to just ask if there are further questions. Amber, do you have any closing comments you want to give to us before we close out today and, and have any final questions? I, I, I Yeah, not off the top of my head, but I would. Delphi will be very upset if you don't show her last slides. <laughs> oh, I do that. She gave herself full credit. <laughs> she did. She did a great job. Tell Delphi, we're all very impressed. So uh, this is Amber's email, which is yep. You can skip to the next one. <laughs> if you have questions. And then there is brought to you by Delphi. Oh. I take full credit for the solo slideshow. Uh. And, and mom wanted to have pictures of Delphi in here. Oh. And so, yeah. And then I believe the last one, she just thought she was super funny making herself big. And then it she calls me Momber. And yeah. apparently I'm the brain and she's the uh -huh. You engage her and then allow, allowed her to be a part of this process with us as well. I think that's so beautiful and powerful. Empowering for her. Yeah. yeah, she was going for a laugh, so I'm glad she got it. I will tell her it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Are there any closing questions? Yeah, Aurelia. Um, you mentioned that there's such a thing as multi-trauma, and that got me to thinking, first of all, I think that right about now, the majority of the population is traumatized in one way or another. I would say 50% of us. And the other thing is, when you say trauma, what is typically considered trauma? One incident, or is it a series of incidents? So, um... I want to make sure to give you the correct terminology. So if you want to look it up later, you can. Um, so trauma is anything that your nervous system can't handle in the moment. Okay. Just that. So it can be something small and it can be one time. Um, like maybe you haven't, you've had a pretty calm, happy childhood and then you get married and you have kids and a birth goes very badly. That would be something that might cause PTSD and trauma in your body that you might process through. What we were talking about before is called complex trauma, and it's abbreviated to CPTSD. So if you look that up, that's what you're going to want to look for to learn more, CPTSD, complex trauma. Um, and that refers to having multiple instances throughout your life or in one year, anything that's just more than one, basically, where you're, it's layered, your trauma is layered and it's been compounded. Um, right. And then I totally agree that the entire population has been experiencing a collective trauma since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, you could feel it in the air when that happened, like cut it with a knife. There are people have handled that in a variety of ways, and some are doing better than others. And you know, it, it, uh, there have been so many losses that it's just it's been difficult for everyone. So, uh, absolutely, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I I also believe that the more we talk about it, the more we can be there for each other because we're not in this alone. We're, we've all been going through that that piece together, even though it might look different person to person. Did that answer the question? Yes, but before this um, incident, 
Would you say that most people have one particular traumatic event? I, I still believe that it's a series of, of events that everyone goes through. I can't believe that it's just one. I can believe that one may be more salient than others, but just life itself, especially if you're sick. This is, that's a really interesting, um, good point. And it speaks to how highly sensitive or not people are. Um, I think that the, that you all that are here participating in this class, I would guess are more energetically and emotionally sensitive and empathetic. And when you fall into that category, you experience things as more traumatic from a physiological level than people who don't. So I have a brother, for instance, who's only 14 months apart from me. We had identical childhoods. I have many, many traumas. He remembers the same moments and it really didn't affect him. He likes to say that he thought he had a, a super happy childhood until he talked to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, everyone is affected differently. So um, I, I think that you're right. There are probably everyone has multiple things that could have been traumatic, whether or not that registered that way in their nervous system is different person to person. Okay, I got it. And I think, yeah, that's why I think like, you know, Sylvia's got her highly sensitive people group happening twice a month now on the second and fourth Monday. And it's an opportunity for those that are highly sensitive to really understand that better and talk about it because those of us that were empaths and highly sensitive really didn't even have terminology for it, most of us that are older growing up. And we didn't understand those terms and yet we were experiencing things so in such a way that is if somebody you're hitting a cannon in my gut and somebody else is da 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 da, you know. And yeah. so we do have a very different response system. So those are great questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I had a, I had a comment. When I was at the VA, I would have soldiers that had been in the same battle, and one would have PTSD and one wouldn't. Perfect example. Their, their yep. responses were totally different. Yep. Yeah. Back to that. Yeah, I mean, that's why the bumblebee example is so poignant, because you, you have the exact same moment in time and you're seeing and experiencing the, the exact same thing, but your perception makes all the difference in how that affects you long-term. And we'll talk about how this more comes into like our whole unity perspective, but about then how we did the healing more. So more of the activities of that, and we're gonna do some more of those activities next week. Um, I want to say thank you to Amber for bringing us such amazing, good quality information. <laughs> and Delphi, and Delphi, tell her, we, you know, we thank her too. And I uh, want to let you know that we are grateful. This is on a love offering basis. We have a donate button online. If you go into the donation section, if you go to donation number two, and that's where Heal Our Trauma class is located, if you'd like to give that way, um, the money gets shared with Amber, myself, and the, uh, and the community, the church. So we are so grateful and hope to see you next week. Same time, same place. We'll have some new handouts to go out. We'll send those out to you online. And then we'll have them here for those of you that are here in person. Um, and I just want to say, give yourself a big pat on the back for being here and uh, bringing your amazing selves. You know, you are, are fabulous. And we just say together, yeah. And so it is. <laughs>